Hello and welcome to the first draft of my Mars design reference mission using SLS and Falcon Heavy. This will be my first attempt to land substantial hardware on Mars and is basically a test run for a full crewed Mars landing and return mission with three Kerbals. Uh, so it'll probably fail miserably but we'll see how far I can get and what I need to do to fix it. I've confined myself to using components that are existing or in development with one minor exception that I'll get to later on. I've used a number of sources to handle this as realistically as possible and the mission architecture broadly matches the Mars semi-direct design in Robert Zubrin's The Case for Mars, though with additional buffer on many points including life support. The first launch that you see here on the launch pad is an SLS Block 1B carrying our first payload, the Mars Ascent Vehicle. And there it goes. We're already lined up with Mars. We have a very favorable transfer actually. And while this launch proceeds, let me discuss the space launch system, the SLS briefly, and talk about its uh, three main variants, the Block 1, Block 1B, and Block 2. NASA's space launch system, or SLS, comes in three flavors, Block 1, Block 1B, and Block 2. Block 1 is the smallest, Block 2 is the largest. All three versions have the same center stack, the same core, and that core is marked by the four space shuttle main engines. So Rockdyne RS-25s at the bottom here, all three variants have the same four engines at the bottom, and those engines will burn for about seven minutes as I have it here. They burn for one minute and 35, well, they burn for about two minutes with the SRBs. The burn time here is not reading quite correctly. And then the further five minutes on their own. Now, the difference between the three versions then is in the outer boosters here and also the upper stage. So for block one and for, for block one B, the boosters are five segment versions of the Space Shuttle's solid rocket boosters. The Space Shuttle had four segment solid rocket boosters and these are five segment versions of that. Mainly that means that they produce much larger thrust and uh, they do last for a little bit longer but that's not the main effect. The main effect is more thrust on the ground. And then after they separate, after about uh, two minutes and a few seconds, then the space shuttle main engines here, four of them continue onward and in the block one case it will get close to orbit and then the second stage here will proceed to complete orbit and then boost the capsule onto the moon. And block one is really only for the moon. It's not suited for Mars missions primarily because of the diameter of this tank but also because of Delta V considerations. The, delta, uh, the diameter of this tank is 5 meters, so the second stage, the second stage incidentally is a single RL-10 engine, so RL-10B2 there, and the diameter of this stage being 5 meters means that it can't accommodate the larger heat shields that would be necessary for a large mission to Mars. We really need the full diameter of the SLS, which is 8.4 meters across, in order to accommodate the large heat shields and so we need to rely on Block 1B and Block 2 for our Mars missions. The upper stage of the Block 1 is a Delta Cryogenic Second Stage, also called the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS. This, the upper stage of the Block 1B, which is the only difference between it and the Block 1, is called the Exploration Upper Stage. Now, for the Block 1, the capacity to low Earth orbit is 70 tons. For for the Block 1B, the capacity to low Earth orbit is a little bit complicated because really this is meant to fling things to Mars. And so, first of all, we see that it has the full diameter, the 8.4 meters. It has four RL-10 B2s, and the stated amount that it can fling to Mars is 31.7 tons. Now, uh, that is with a lot of margin for error and you have to understand that when designing launchers they always upgrade the capabilities after the fact because uh, frankly the payload sizes get larger and it turns out if you tell people that you're going to be able to manage 31.7 tons they'll end up giving you something like 35 tons or more than that. Uh, it's tough to keep the masses down. That's mainly what engineers do is try to trim off the mass but uh, it, it's, a, it's a complicated iterative procedure. Anyway, but uh, so what I found is that this can actually manage about 40 tons to Mars. Now um, that is with uh, ideal trajectory 
it should be noted we're talking about uh, the best possible transfers and all that so but anyway uh, this has four RL10 B2s burning for 80 minutes and it should be 45 seconds so uh, I've got a little bit of a rounding error there I'll discuss the block 2 further on but for now let's uh, just conclude with this view of the Mars Ascent vehicle atop the second stage of the SLS block 1B and it's getting ready for engine shutdown as it approaches orbit and there we go the Orbit at this point was 289 by 171 kilometers, uh, but it will soon be boosting itself further up on its way to transfer. So next up is the launch of the Habitation Module, the HAB for short, on an SLS-1B. This is the module that will carry the crew to Mars and also be their living space on Mars once it lands there. It will not then proceed back into orbit around Mars, that would be very ungainly though some mission parameters have that, some mission designs have the HAB actually going back into orbit, but I don't think that's feasible in this case. So let me talk a little bit more about the habitation module and what's involved in its portion of the mission. So back to the VAB as this launch proceeds. So this is the HAB module portion of our mission, and I seriously doubt that the real HAB module will look like this. Now the HAB modules goal in the Mars semi-direct version and probably the NASA version would be to bring the crew to Mars and also land on Mars. So they will get, get go to Mars on this and also live on Mars in this. So this hab has accommodations for three people. As I understand it, this Bigelow Sundancer inflatable habitat, it says here it's now cancelled. So that's unfortunate, but uh, it's probably the most likely candidate um, just because of its size. Uh, it's nine tons here, so and that's just the structure. There's uh, more apparatus here, as you can see. Uh, in fact, if you sum all the all this together, the payload is 45.2 tons. So it's likely that even though I've got it on the SLS Block 1B, it really should be launching on the SLS Block 2. Uh, that's uh, unless we can have another vessel rendezvous with it to refuel it. The total amount of fuel in here is 4.5 tons of liquid methane and liquid oxygen and then uh, further 1.4 tons of monomethylhydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide and of course that's for stability. Uh, here we have uh, Super Draco's uh, remade to burn methane. I'm not entirely Okay, I'm, I'm pretty confident that that would be very difficult, but we need some sort of radial engines that can burn methane. Uh, the RL-10s will not be, uh, well, it won't be very easy to manage them with uh, the heat shielding requirements, but, um, well, that's up to NASA. They, if they want to use the RL uh, the common extensible cryogenic engines burning methane, then the heat shielding issue will be quite complicated and probably quite heavy. This was my lightweight solution to that. Now you can see that we have substantial resources in terms of food, water, and oxygen. And of course that's because for most of the journey, the astronauts will be living in here. And uh, so the total life support uh, for three crew, uh, 118 days with uh, food, 121 days with water, and 241 days with oxygen. However, we've got a lot of carbon dioxide recycling here we've got uh, capacity of lithium hydroxide. Uh, the 45 ton mass of this module includes a full load of lithium hydroxide. And of course we've got uh, auxiliary scrubbers here with lithium hydroxide as well. And so we've got many redundant systems to make sure that we've got CO2 managed. Uh, we've also got a little rover here. I don't know if you can see. Unfortunately this way of uh, keeping the rover in, this is actually supposed to be a ramp and uh, maybe I can demonstrate that. Uh, so it's like this to help the rover get down and this turned out to be a very bad idea and you will see that in the main mission. Uh, this this did not work out very well but it, it was a cute idea uh, while I didn't realize it was going to cause so much problem. But yeah so we have a rover and that's essential, of course, because on the ground on Mars, this HAB module is going to have to be landed pretty close to the ascent vehicle so that the astronauts can return back off of the ground on Mars. 
and it's close enough so that the rover can get them to it. Uh, if we don't have the rover, then they can't really get to the Mars Ascent Vehicle unless uh, NASA can land it very close to the Mars Ascent Vehicle, which, which might be difficult. And of course for me, pretty much impossible. Okay, so uh, yeah, the total amount of uh, life support equipment on, on this is uh, close to 18, it's actually 17 point, no sorry, it's 18.8 .8 tons. And that includes the lithium hydroxide. 18.8 .8 tons of food, water, oxygen, life support, buffer, containment, all of that, and the lithium hydroxide, 18.8 .8 tons. Uh, once you subtract out the fuel, the parachutes, power, heat shield, and the, and the life support, the core of this is uh, around 12 tons. The rover is 0.6 tons. The descent engines are 0.8 tons. So the hab structure, descent tank, and landing legs 11.3 tons. Okay, and I think that uh, says it all. I, do I think that this is how it's going to look? No. Uh, it simply was the most logical way to place the pieces that I had. And so, but basically any NASA attempt to launch a uh, HAB module to Mars will at least have to have the same components, if not the same arrangement. The, 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 I've, tried to accommodate all considerations but again the heat shielding is a question because I don't know what the requirements there are uh, whether we need a forward shell or not and also uh, radiation shielding and part of it is radiation shielding on the way can this HAB module really shield our our crew properly and also radiation shielding on the ground which uh, there's wide variation as to the estimates of whether such a thing would be sufficient. Uh, some estimates say that this will be quite sufficient and others would say that it is woefully inefficient and we need some way to uh, use, for instance, the Martian regolith to provide additional radiation shielding, basically pile dirt on top of it. Um, so that is the situation with the HAB module. Again, I'm launching on SLS block 1b, but with its mass it probably would require SLS block 2. Okay, and during all of that the HAB has started and will soon finish its first burn for TransMars injection because the stage takes 18 minutes and 45 seconds to burn. It takes two burns. It goes around Earth and then burns again and actually it'll have a rendezvous with the crew uh, between the two burns. Here we see the Mars Ascent vehicle getting ready for its first burn. A slightly different modification on the mission design would be to have a space tug pull it up for this first burn, in other words boost it up to a higher orbit, and then reserve the fuel in the Block 1B to boost it to trans-Mars injection. In that case, the SLS-1B would be able to carry a much larger payload. And in that case, also perhaps it won't be necessary to use this rocket, which is the Block 2 SLS. And here you see the two huge boosters, with each with two F1 engines, and we'll talk more about this in a moment. But uh, here it's carrying the Earth Return Vehicle, which is the vehicle that will bring the crew back home. Again, this mission is built around three crew members. Other mission parameters have four crew members or six crew members. I've gone with three because it was basically as much as I could fit. So um, here we go with the launch of the SLS Block 2 and the Earth Return Vehicle. This rocket is more massive than the Saturn V. It has more payload capacity to low Earth orbit than the Saturn V. So let's talk about it, this Block 2 SLS, as well as the details of the Earth Return Vehicle that will be so critical for this mission. The difference between SLS Block 1B and Block 2 is with the outer boosters. Instead of using the five-segment SRBs, we will have larger boosters and probably the intention is to go with liquid fuel boosters in the form of uh, two F1 engines on each side. So these are Perios boosters. I don't know if this is exactly how they're going to look, but it was basically the best way I could figure out how to fit boosters that have the right burn time and two F1 engines at the bottom. They'll be F1Bs and uh, you can see them sort of in line here. 
And I've assumed that they'll have a burn time similar to what they had in the Saturn V rocket, but that is not necessarily going to be the case. They do seem rather large here, and so I don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty about Block 2 because the boosters, frankly, haven't been built yet. We haven't seen a test of them yet, and so that's ephemeral and quite a ways down the road. But this would be able to deliver a much larger payload to Mars, obviously. It's hard to imagine that uh, with four F-1 engines plus the Space Shuttle main engines like this, that it would be delivering less than 130 tons to low Earth orbit, really. Uh, there's really no point to having this much engine power to deliver anything less than Saturn V. Alright, so here we have the Earth Return Vehicle and the Earth Return Hab. And that's something that Mars plans don't often address, is whether there's going to be a habitat, some, some sort of extra space that the astronauts can take up on the way back from Mars. Usually, the way to Mars is uh, very spacious, but the question of how they get back from Mars tends to be a little bit tighter. I've assumed that we do need some sort of uh, habitat for them, something that they can live in, and so, of course, this is a deployable habitat. And the capsule here will flip around and dock with this. So uh, this is the main Earth return vehicle with the fuel and the engine. The engine is a common extensible cryogenic engine with a methane burning setup. So this is going to be methane and oxygen. And that gets, uh, th just this capsule has 3065. It's pushing the hab, it has less. But uh, I think it's going to be enough, but that's something I have to test. And so that's something I'm doing in the course of this episode. We have a heat shield down here. It is, um, I, I've put a minimal amount of blade of shielding. Uh, really, this is as much as the SLS Block 2 can carry to Mars. And in fact, it's probably more than the SLS Block 2 can boost to Mars. Now, you'll notice I've just got a nose cone here instead of a launch escape system, and that's, of course, because it is the Earth return vehicle. The astronauts are not going to be launching up into orbit in this. They're just going to be coming back. This is going to launch unmanned over to Mars, get into Mars orbit, and then only after they've completed their mission will the astronauts board this and return. So, no need for a launch escape system since, unless NASA wants to recover the capsule in the case of uh, emergency, uh, it's not necessary and of course it would be extra mass. The key thing is of course life support. Uh, this has to provide the life support for the entire way back. We also have to have the option to ditch the HAB just in case uh, for Delta V reasons we need to uh, just use the capsule uh, to return. Obviously they will. it's not safe to return with just the HAB uh, because you can't re-enter like that. You could conceivably rendezvous with something. It does have the docking port. But uh, in any case, the life support is actually here. The total amount of life support in this is, uh, with a crew of three, which is the baseline for this mission, 216 days. And uh, with the CO2 scrubbing, that boosts the oxygen up to 216 days as well. Uh, so that is the uh, that's probably on the upper limit. Uh, normally for the return journey, we're talking about 180 days. So uh, that is a fair amount of food, water, and oxygen. I have checked out the mass of the system, and it seems to compare well with the estimates from both uh, the Johnson Space Center as well as Robert Zubrin's own estimates for how much life support will be necessary. So uh, actually, I think I have a lot more margin than Robert Zubrin does. So it is a good solid system. The main questions about whether this is a good system or not is the heat shielding. And uh, not so much the heat shielding for the return, uh, which we do have a substantial heat shield at the bottom of this pod. The question is the heat shielding for entry into uh, Mars, the aero capture. We are not doing a full capture into uh, descent, obviously. We just need to be barely captured into orbit and then this can further aero break after that. But how much shielding we need, whether we need a forward air, aero shell, that is something I can't answer. So yeah, it's possible that this system might require a lot more heat shielding. Radiation shielding, um, mainly uh, in any serious radiation event like uh, uh, some solar activity, 
uh, the crew will have to stay in the pod. I doubt that the HAB will be sufficiently radiation shielded for those events, but otherwise they can stay in the in the radi in the HAB and be relatively safe. So that is the basic setup for this portion of the mission, the Earth return portion, which is the heaviest portion and uh, sort of the most critical portion uh, because once you get into Mars orbit, this is your only way back. And while I was talking about all of that, the Earth return vehicle has done both burns in order to send itself over to Mars and so therefore we see the second stage drifting away. It has to be said that I didn't hit the trajectory quite right on these burns and so the result was a much faster tr uh, transfer to Mars but one that has cost some fuel out of the Earth return vehicle so that it won't be able to actually bring the hat back with it. Right now it's short of fuel. Okay so here's the Mars Ascent vehicle relighting and it is going to do its second burn and so after this burn it is going to be on its way to Mars. While it's doing that let's talk more about this component of the mission. So here we have the first payload of our mission and the lightest of our payloads but probably the most complicated one and this is the Mars Ascent vehicle and this I have attempted to keep well within the margins of the SLS Block 1B estimates and so this is within 31.7 tons to be delivered to Mars and of that uh, a large portion is the heat shield. The heat shield is actually about 10% uh, which is less than a lot of the estimates for how much heat shielding we'll need but uh, there is margin because this includes a lot of structure and you can see structural parts here and probably uh, NASA will not have to add these structural parts the way I have and they will be able to make it uh, way less and so in that case all the structural parts could be added to the heat shield mass to uh, make up the difference. So uh, other than that it carries some fuel with it uh, for the landing. It carries 8.5 tons of liquid methane and liquid oxygen. It will be 14 tons fully fueled but right now it's not fully fueled because it doesn't need all of that fuel in order to slow down on Mars. And slowing down on descent, it's got common extensible cryogenic engines that burn methane, two of them, as you can see here. Uh, on the outside ring, we have the drilling units uh, or whatever in situ resource utilization units are necessary to refuel this. Um, you could have scoops for taking in carbon dioxide breaking the carbon off using the oxygen as oxygen uh, oxidizer obviously. Uh, the, the carbon can be combined with hydrogen uh, that can be carried with the vehicle or otherwise uh, drilled in the form of water so H2O, com uh, H2O could be separated out into oxygen for the oxidizer and hydrogen to combine with, with carbon into methane CH4. And so there are many ways to create fuel for this and the total in situ plant, in situ resource utilization plant uh, is four tons. That's m what much heavier than the estimates for how much it will weigh. So I assume that that allows for margin to carry hydrogen feedstock. Estimates for hydrogen feedstock to uh, potentially uh, produce methane without relying on water resources. Uh, uh, go up to about seven tons but that was for a larger mission with four astronauts or six astronauts we are only assuming three astronauts and so the amount that we have to produce is much less. Uh, one resource that we can't produce there is the RCS fuel which is monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. As far as I know there are no RCS units that burn methane and oxygen that would be very convenient but we have to manage our RCS fuel then very carefully and here it is shut off and uh, these outer units, these outer tanks will be used on the way to Mars and during descent and then the inner resources will be used on ascent and on docking we'll use the resources in the ascent vehicle which you can't, oh there we go you can see that the ascent vehicle has monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide for docking with the earth return vehicle now this does not carry much by way of life support. It carries seven days worth for three crew and that is because really this is only meant to be used 
to get off the ground from Mars and rendezvous with the Earth return vehicle. Uh, other than that, uh, we have lander legs, as you can see. Um, we have solar panels to, uh, to help power the production of our fuel and the total mass of the solar panels. Uh, well, I should mention solar panels, the power, st the structure, the landing gear, and uh, additional margin for the heat shielding, total 9.1 tons. And uh, you could use the margin that uh, is potentially for the heat shielding to add to the hydrogen feedstock. I'm not entirely sure what the balance of that would be. Now, we have a remote controller here because of course this is going to Mars uncrewed. And what might not be obvious here is that there is a decoupler here and decoupler here. What ascends from Mars is simply the center pod. All of this outer structure gets left behind, including these useless parachutes here, though it does carry these uh, uh, drag chutes, stroke chutes with it. And so all the outer structure, that, uh, that 12 tons or so, gets left behind. And so a much lighter vehicle ascends from Mars. And we have well above 4,000 meters per second of delta V once you uh, calculate it all out. The ascent portion fully fueled is 19.3 tons. Empty of fuel, it's 4.8 tons. So you're talking about uh, 14 tons of fuel. Uh, 14.5 tons of fuel actually and so and that includes the RCS fuel the monomethyl hydrazine and N204 and so that gets you your more than 4,000 meters per second of Delta V so that's the Mars ascent vehicle it can fit on SLS block 1b it's probably the first payload I'd launch uh, certainly the first thing you'd want is to get the in C2 resource utilization on the way make sure you can do that properly before ascending anything else but uh, the issue is that probably all three components of the mission that need to be sent to Mars will have to be sent pretty close to each other because otherwise there's the possibility of system breakdown uh, just over time things do go wrong and so we would want to avoid that okay so that is the Mars ascent vehicle so far all the components of the mission have been sent up without crew and the reason for that is because I felt that the Falcon Heavy would be a cheaper option to deliver the crew into even a high Earth orbit uh, in preparation for transfer. And that is what we're going to do here. As you note, the HAB is already in a high orbit. And here we are launching the Falcon Heavy to meet up with the HAB module. And so let's talk a little bit about the Falcon Heavy and what potential roles it could have in any sort of Mars mission and its limitations. So here we have Falcon Heavy and in this case with the Dragon version 2 crew pod and for my money this is probably the way that I would send the crew up there. We, it's not efficient to send the crew on SLS. Uh, what you'd have is unmanned SLS launches and then the crew sent up on Falcon Heavy. In a way this is very similar to the Constellation program where Ares 1 would be used to launch the crew and Ares 5 launching the cargo and uh, in this case Falcon Heavy or Falcon 9 possibly would take the place of the Ares 1. Uh, you would use Falcon 9 if you were going to rendezvous with the, the HAB module in low Earth orbit. You would use Falcon Heavy as I'm going to if you have already boosted the HAB module into a higher orbit and need to rendezvous with it in that eccentric orbit which is close to escape. Uh, not necessarily close to escape but at least halfway. So that is why I'm using Falcon Heavy rather than Falcon 9. Falcon 9 can handle the Dragon pod as well. The Dragon of course can carry more than three crew, it can carry seven and so even for larger Mars missions it can handle the job and whether the dragon can be retrieved after being flung out to a high orbit I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it has sufficient heat shielding to return after being uh, sent into a highly eccentric orbit around the Earth instead of low Earth orbit uh, but presumably uh, it's still cheaper than trying to launch the crew on SLS. So that is a possibility, possible use for SpaceX's Falcon systems, either Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy and if we launch it into a high orbit and launch the HAB module into high orbit, it's possible to save the fuel on the HAB module 
so that we can use block 1b instead of block 2. Uh, in that case, we would have a space tug pull the HAB module to its high orbit. So we'll launch uh, SLS block 1b into a low Earth orbit, use some sort of space tug to pull it out to a higher orbit, and then we'll be able to use block 1b instead of block 2. Remember, the HAB module is 45 tons and way heavier than is really meant for block 1b. But uh, so the use of Falcon Heavy to launch the Dragon capsule to launch the crew up there would be the best way to get the crew up into that orbit. And it has plenty of margin for that. Uh, the Delta V on the second stage in particular is quite, quite robust. There is one other possible use for Falcon Heavy and let me cover that right here. Now I should uh, make it very clear that Falcon Heavy is not an option to launch the actual payloads to Mars. Um, it's not a matter of Delta V. Uh, a lot of people have proposed pu putting everything together in smaller pieces and then sending it over to Mars. It's not because of the payload capacity. It is because of the payload diameter. The, the large heat shields make it impossible to use the Falcon Heavy. Now SpaceX is planning larger vehicles that might be useful, but the diameter of this is 2.9 meters and the diameter of the fairing is just nowhere near what would be necessary to accom accommodate the large large heat shields that we need for Mars entry, whether it's uh, the lighter aero capture or a full aero braking to descent. But what, what it can do, what Falcon Heavy can do, is send up a fuel tank or a tug. And so that's what we have here. This is a 40-ton uh, Hydrolox fuel tank, and so this is just this is just a fuel tank in this case. But you can launch a space tug instead, and in that case, this will be full of fuel for the tug's engines. And so uh, two different variants. Uh, in this case, we have the fuel for this engine, the SS engine, which is used by the European Space Agency. Um, the monomethylhydrazine N204 for that but uh, and so it uses very little uh, fuel to rendezvous and then it uh, docks up with potentially something that can take the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen from here 40 tons is all we can put on that's it might require many launches to fill up the tank of for instance the block 1b or block 2's second stage the problem with this is that we have never demonstrated the ability to transfer liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen in orbit. Um, transfer of, of non-cryogenic fuels is possible and that has been demonstrated. The normal hypergolic fuels like uh, MMH and N204, that has been done. But cryogenic fuels are a little bit trickier, trickier to handle and so it's not certain that we could transfer the fuel uh, to the Block 1B or Block 2 second stages. What is more likely is to actually fill this all up with MMH and N204 and then use this as a tug. And so that's a possible way to uh, use smaller rockets, but still you need the SLS's large diameter. Now if you can design heat shields that can fit into this diameter, inflatable heat shields for instance, uh, something like this, uh, we have I believe one somewhere in here. Ah, here we go. So uh, let me put it on the top here. So you can have an inflatable heat shield and that might work or it might not work. Um, that's an interesting question and so that has to be demonstrated. So in short there is a use for Falcon Heavy and that is to launch space tug, to launch extra fuel or to launch the crew. And if you can make small small heat shields then you could potentially launch components of the mission though you'll have to take a larger number of launches and have a lot of docking in low earth orbit. Okay so our crew has been transferred there was a little mishap with the Dragon's trunk a staging error there but no matter the crew is there in the HAB and it is now positioning itself for its second burn the one that will bring it to Mars. It should be noted that the second stage doesn't have to be discarded uh, tether, uh, for instance, using a Kerbal Attachment System, uh, could connect the payload, uh, the HAB, to the second stage and they could swing around a central point to generate artificial gravity. Uh, one of the main considerations for this mission is how to generate some sort of artificial gravity so that the crew isn't in uh, microgravity for an extended period of time. 
Uh, next up, I want to add a few more details about the Ascent Vehicle. You might have already noticed some weird points about it, and I want to address those coming up here. Uh, one other note about the Ascent Vehicle. Uh, you'll notice that the heat shield doesn't quite cover these points here, and I've got nose cones over here. And those are little placeholders, really. What really is meant to go there, and what I'd like to see go there, are additional uh, heat shields, inflatable heat shields. And so it looks something more like, well, the problem is the reason I didn't put the inflatable heat shields is because this one is too big. And so it doesn't really fit down there. One final strange design choice you might have noticed is the use of this winglet here. And the reason I have to put the winglet here is because for reasons unknown to me, Curl Space Program thinks that there is lift on this tank, I believe. Or at least there is some lift on this side that to counteract with the winglet there. And so that's why it's there. Uh, presumably NASA will not have to do that. So there we have it, and all three components of our mission are now on their way to Mars. Here you see the trajectory of the HAB module, and it is approaching at 194 km periapsis in 167 days, which is very quick. Uh, a normal quick trajectory would be 180 days, and a slow one might be 210 days. Here's the Mars Ascent vehicle, of course, uh, still retaining its second stage because that still has fuel in, and uh, here it has an approach of about a thousand kilometers after 169 days, again very quick, but uh, we should be able to air break these at, air capture these at 50 kilometer uh, periapsis. Once we get there, we'll make that adjustment. Here we have the Earth return vehicle, and it's on a dangerously quick trajectory. It's arriving in 123 days, at 130 kilometer periapsis. To air break it, we would have to air break at an altitude of 37 kilometers. Uh, in order to get this trajectory, it's already burned a lot of fuel, and on arrival, as we see here, it approaching Mars, it's going to have to burn a lot more fuel in order to correct its uh, orbit, and that actually already condemns it to not being able to return. So this portion of the mission has already failed, but there's good reason to believe that if I had it on a slower trajectory to Mars, say a 210-day trajectory, it would have uh, succeeded a little bit better. Now, as far as re-entry heating is concerned, uh, because this is simply trying to get an aero capture, it doesn't need the intense heat shielding that uh, that especially something like Curiosity would have needed. So you'll see these uh, vehicles get into re-entry heating, and you might wonder, well, they don't have the aero shell. I've talked a little bit about the potential need for an aero shell, but they are not doing a direct descent to the ground. They're simply trying to get into an aero capture into a high orbit, and then they might uh, aero break further after that. So it's, uh, that's why I'm not sure whether an aero shell might be necessary. Uh, so far, our Mars missions like Curiosity are straight to the ground, and that's why they need the aero shell in order to survive. This, of course, isn't going to the ground at all. Um, it just needs to burn off about, uh, on the order of about 1,000 meters per second will do the trick, and that'll get into orbit. Even though I say it was a fast trajectory, the transfer burn was about 3,840, well, it was 3,847 meters per second. Uh, compared to the Mars Ascent Vehicle and the HAB, which burned 3,630 odd meters per second. So it's just an additional 200 meters per second on top of what they did. But anyway, here we see it's getting captured into orbit, and so that was successful. Uh, perhaps deadly reentry needs to tur be turned up a bit, and maybe this will be a lot more serious. Uh, in fact, here the amount of blade shielding I had on there, which was minimal, uh, didn't really burn off, so it didn't experience significant heating as far as deadly reentry re was concerned. And perhaps those measures need to be turned up, but it survived a 37 kilometer periapsis to capture. And uh, that is the resulting orbit. Now, uh, important point, I am not trying to get into good orbits for rendezvous. It was not my uh, expectation that this would work out. And so there is no attempt to land the HAB and the Ascent vehicle in the same spot, for instance. That's something I need more practice on. And certainly no attempt to make the Earth return vehicle easy to rendezvous with. And so it's just in an arbitrary orbit, and at least I demonstrated that I could get it into orbit, but it doesn't have any fuel to, enough fuel to get back to Earth, so sort of a Pyrrhic victory. 
But anyway, I've got some numbers to work with and I'll know how to adjust it for future missions. Next up was the HAB module, and this would not normally be the order of operations, by the way. Uh, normally what you would send is uncrewed Mars Ascent Vehicle, HAB, and Earth Return Vehicle, and then on the next go-around, after two years or so, send uh, uncrewed Ascent Vehicle, uncrewed Earth Return Vehicle, and then a crewed HAB. So you have a backup habitation module on the ground. So in total you'd need six launches of SLS. Uh, and all, everything is backed up, so you have two Earth Return Vehicles, two Ascent Vehicles to work with, and so you have redundancy and a way to abort that is uh, reliable. So, yep, that would be the plan. Here we have the HAB, and remember I told you how the little ramp I made for the rover uh, would cause problems? Well, this is where it caused problems. You see, those pieces uh, decided to go in places that I didn't expect them to go, and possibly because of that hinge and its placement and the net result was a rotation and here you see it's starting up here and this definitely shouldn't have survived this and so definitely daily re-entry needs to be tweaked up a bit uh, for future attempts. You can see the pieces on the top there above the hab and now to the right of it and so they're causing asymmetric drag which is causing it to spin and uh, yeah definitely not a survivable situation and so on this already I would call this a failure it so happened to survive but uh, certainly not what we want to see in any sort of Mars mission again this is a 50 kilometer aero capture 50 kilometer periapsis around Mars and it was successful there but uh, uh, we did get aero captured but we've certainly got a problem and I was worried there's the resulting orbit and I was worried what would happen when we tried to land it if it's spinning like that that seems like it's not going to survive I corrected my orbit a little bit at apoapsis here and uh, here we have both the RCS and the and the methane burning Super Dracos to work with and that's why I needed the methane burning Super Dracos was to potentially be able to use them uh, for to slow down the descent for instance and for making orbital adjustments uh, which might be impossible for just the RCS here the panels really were going crazy and you can see them sort of uh, dangling out there not entirely sure how that sort of works but there they are and causing this spinning that you see here on the bright side, the life support situation for the HAB was not bad. So, life support was robust, uh, the design flawed, and how to get that rover down is going to be an issue when I can't uh, rely on these panels the way I did. But anyway, this is the actual landing descent. Uh, so we're actually trying to land it here, and there, there came about another problem. We have to slow down, and it's tough to slow something this big down. And it's really tough when parachute deployment fails. What I failed to do here was arm the parachutes. And so here I'm igniting the Super Dracos in an attempt to slow down, but without the parachutes it's pointless. There's no way that I can get this down safely without the parachutes. You have to arm the parachutes to avoid this sort of situation. And you'll see that with the Mars Ascent vehicle. Uh, unfortunately this is where we had our crew and this is why you send the HAB ahead of time without the crew and then send a subsequent HAB with the crew so you know that the HAB works out but anyway uh, here we go so yes obvious failure of the habitat and yeah but valuable information to bring back for the next attempt. So, not all bad, and here we have the Mars Ascent Vehicle approaching Mars, and hopefully we can get this down safely at least. Now, it has the best margins, it's the lightest vehicle, and so that's a positive. It's still got its transfer stage there, we'll discard that soon, but it was able to make all of the corrections that were necessary using that second stage. There was hydrogen boil off, we lost some of the Delta V that was left in the second stage, but there was still a little bit left for corrections, and of course the RCS system was still available. 
So only now does the Mars Ascent vehicle retract its solar panels and start using its own RCS. It had reserved its RCS all the way through this. And here, minor course corrections in order to make sure that we re-enter we enter at uh, 50 kilometers periapsis. So here we go. This is the system I've tested the most. And in fact, when I did re-entry testing to figure out the altitudes to aero break at, or aero capture at, I used this vehicle. So I knew that this would survive. One problem I had was that I still had a little uh, decoupler at the base there. I'll get rid of that soon. But uh, yeah, it was because of the testing with this that I realized that I needed to have the center of lift uh, managed with that little canard there. And uh, so it's nice and balanced and it's got its RCS firing to make sure its orientation is safe. Uh, I don't know if you noticed in the habitation module, we actually ran out of RCS fuel by the way uh, on that one. It trying to keep itself oriented properly while spinning around, it just used up all its, of its RCS. That won't happen here. It has good RCS margins, this uh, Ascent vehicle. And there it is firing as it uh, has made its orbit, it has gotten captured. Now, once in orbit, I do arm the parachutes. It's got four drogue chutes and four main chutes. The heavier main chutes are on the structure, whereas the drogue chutes are on the pod itself. And here at Apoapsis, I correct my periapsis to ensure a soft landing. And so that's happening here. Not too sure about reusing heat shields like this. I gather that that's not a doable thing, and so perhaps what will be necessary is Two heat shields, dual heat shields, is uh, one possibility. Uh, we could use the main heat shield and then have inflatable heat shields on the structure like I showed in the VAB earlier. And maybe the inflatable heat shields can cover the whole body. But anyway, here we have the main descent to landing and the parachutes are armed now. So I, I learned from my mistake there and that will avoid the whole parachute deployment has failed. For some reason, uh, something is interfering with parachute deployment even when it should be able to deploy uh, based on the real shoot settings that I have. So anyway, real shoot was able to deploy the parachutes properly this time. Heat shield discarded, freeing the RL-10s, uh, actually the common extensible cryogenic engines burning methane. Uh, to do their job, which is slow the craft down. There is very little time to slow down when you're on Mars descent, and so every little bit counts. We've got these nice parachutes to help us out, and uh, it was looking good. It was looking good at this point, but uh, the you might notice on uh, NASA videos, uh, they discard the parachutes right before landing, and people wonder why. Why would you get rid of the parachutes right before landing? Why would you cut the parachutes and land on the thrust alone? Well, I discovered that here. I didn't really understand it before, but I, I thought it was because that they might want to uh, have the pilot angle for a particular spot, you know, avoid any obstacles, a la Neil Armstrong on the moon in Apollo 11, uh, give the pilot that kind of freedom. So that's what I thought. But another situation is it seems like it's very hard to uh, kill kill your velocity when you've got those parachutes hanging off and they don't experience the same drag on Mars that they do on Earth. And here I bring up the HUD for the first time here because I really want to land this properly and it's not working out very well. And you can see, uh, I should emphasize, at no point were there any reaction wheels involved in the making of this video. All maneuvering had to be done with RCS or engine gimbling. So no reaction wheels at all. None of the pods have reaction wheel power. It was all RCS and gimbling. And so you see some of that perilous situation here where the RCS just can't handle it. And the, the parachutes are yanking me this way and that. And I'm having trouble killing my velocity before touchdown. So something I learned without the parachutes, I think it would have been a little bit more manageable. Possibly it would have been more difficult, I don't know. Uh, I probably should up the power of my RCS ports though. More powerful RCS might have to be a thing. And so here we have uh, not the situation you want for your ascent vehicle tumbling around like this. 
Uh, it managed to remain intact through all this tumbling. Of course, gravity on Mars isn't that that serious, uh, but uh, still, I guess that's why you want the little like inflatable balloons when you tumble like this. Yeah, that's not the orientation I wanted the Mars Ascent Vehicle. So, uh, basically this mission ended in total failure, but that was expected. This was a first attempt, and it seems like a lot of the hardware worked out as it should, and I have very good information to try this sort of thing again. But uh, I would like your comments and suggestions. Uh, so one thing I want to try is using Kerbal Attachment System to do that tether thing so that we can generate artificial gravity along the way using the second stage of the SLS. And so there are other touches that I want to add to all of this. And we'll see about that. I have a lot of work to do as far as uh, making sure that I can land the HAB and the Ascent Vehicle in the same location. I haven't even gotten started on trying to figure that out yet. Uh, but uh, here we are. This is my progress so far, and I hope to make further progress in future attempts. I hope you enjoyed this video, this little uh, discussion of how a Mars mission might work using SLS in Falcon Heavy. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.